We're here at the EACTS in Barcelona, Spain. My name is Tom Wynn. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon in Houston, Texas. I'm joined here by two very distinguished faculty members from different parts of the world. First, we have Dr. Rudiger Lange from, Dr., uh, from uh, German Heart Center in Munich, Germany. And we have Dr. Song Wan from the Hong Kong uh, uh, Prince of Wales Hospital. The surgical treatment of mitral valve regurgitation experienced an impressive evolution in the past decade with the transition to more mitral valve repair techniques. This has been due to improved understanding of mitral valve repair techniques as well as improved surgical techniques in the treatment of mitral valve disease. Starting from the patient profile, I want to ask our two panelists a question. What kind of patients are you currently treating at your institution with mitral valve repair and how did their profile change in the last 15 years? Dr. Langer. Um, we we treat all patients who uh, come with a repairable valve with mitral valve repair, regardless of age. The, or, in other hands, um, we repair every valve that is not stenotic. Every valve that is not stenotic. So rheumatic valves. What about ischemic mitral valves? Ischemic uh, functional mitral regurgitation. Um, we also have been repairing a lot. Now recently, after the recent publications uh, that came out, um, in older patients we also tend to replace the valve. So that's a perspective from Germany. Let's talk to Dr. Wan from Hong Kong and get his perspective. Yeah, you know, uh, in Asia, historically, uh, we mainly have a rheumatic heart disease. Uh, in the past, it's predominant uh, etiology, but uh, over the last 15 years, uh, degenerative and also the other, uh, including ischemic mitral, significantly increased the proportion. In our institution now, we, we do much more mitral repair than before. In mainland China, I think still around 50-60% valve disease are rheumatic. So a patient shows up to your clinic, he's asymptomatic with a preserved ejection fraction, uh, and he's looking to figure out whether he needs mitral valve surgery or not. What, how would you advise the cardiologist that's sending you this patient? Um, Severe it, mitral regurgitation, asymptomatic, preserved ejection fraction. If uh, if it's a young patient, we would operate in a minimal invasive fashion on this patient today. Um, if you're confident enough to repair the valve and not to have to replace it, I think you should uh, go straight forward and uh, repair it. Dr. Wan, how do you approach it? Asymptomatic with preserved EF, severe MR. That's a very interesting uh, question. In our hospital, we recently reviewed our uh, cardiology referral pattern and uh, only about 30% this kind of patient being referred to surgery. So it means still 70% patient are uh, on the watch for, uh, watching uh, program. Sure. Well, the problem that I have is trying to convince the patient and the cardiologist that they actually need surgery because the patient is asymptomatic. So how are you able to convince the patient and the cardiologist that even though they're asymptomatic, they're actually really going to need surgery down the line? At first, I absolutely have to confirm that uh, most patients who are, quote, asymptomatic, uh, are not referred by the cardiologist. Um, second part of your question is um, how to convince the patient. Sure. Now, if, if you talk to the patient and get deeper into his uh, no, so-called symptoms, you will find out that, that they are symptomatic. And in a 30 or 40 year old patient who, who is not able to perform sports and to, to have a completely normal and active lifestyle, you can convince this patient to have a repair and then have a better quality of life afterwards. Right. Yeah, you it's uh, very important to uh, let the patient understand there is a big chance the valve can be repaired. Right. Then they are more willing to receive uh, surgery. And I think in the recent ACC H8 guidelines, it's actually now a class one indication for patients who are asymptomatic with preserved VF, uh, assuming that you have a greater 95% chance of repair at a high volume center. So. Uh, that's very important. You know, as physicians, we're striving to always get better outcomes, try to become better technical surgeons. How has your surgical technique technique evolved over the past 15 years, technically? I'll start with Dr. Langer. The, the only advert that has uh, changed is that we do more and more minimal invasive. We started with this technique uh, 15 years ago. There's a learning curve. 
at that time, uh, not too many surgeons uh, had had applied minimal invasive uh, mitral valve uh, repair. Now it's more common. It's about 50% of the cases in, in Germany are uh, done on a, in a minimal invasive way. And uh, so uh, I think this is, in all patients who are younger than 70 years old, this is our first option. So yeah. we've seen an evolution from minimally invasive techniques in Germany. Dr. Wan, how about in Hong Kong? Uh, the Hong Kong trend is not that far yet. We, uh, majority of our repair case still are through the sternotomy. But the good thing is uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, we are starting to do more repair rather than replacement. And that's a very uh, clear, uh, encouraging trend. Sure. Yeah. Let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about the role of new imaging technologies in the treatment of mitral valve disease. There's a lot of advancements in the way we image and look at the mitral valve. How has imaging technology changed your approach to mitral valve surgery? Whether it be 3D echo, whether it be CT scans, whether it be uh, 2D echo. How's, uh, how, what's, how important is imaging prior to the operation? In my eyes, for mitral valve repair, the most important is echo, and uh, especially the the 3D echo uh, can show you very nicely w what the pathology is, uh, where you have to to modify the valve tissue, uh, what what it's uh, the ring dimensions. You have you can have extremely uh, accurate pre-procedural planning for mitral valve repair. I personally think that CT and MR are, are not uh, that important, not as important as echo. However, CT and MR may be very, very important for, for interventions on the mitral valve. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Dr. I, Dr. Wan, what are your thoughts? I agree uh, completely. Uh, mitral repair program is not only surgeons' one-man show. You need to really rely heavily on the cardiologist. In our hospital, we work very closely with a cardiology a colleague who uh, actually uh, are the expert in the 3D echo. So they help us do all the pre-operative uh, planning, select the patient, whether the patient is suitable for repair, especially the ischemic mitral, and we carefully investigate those uh, patients. And intra-op, our cardiologist and uh, anesthetist, they work together carefully evaluate our repair result and post-op they routinely follow those patients initially every six months then afterwards every year so we have a actually very good database for all the repair patients and then we actually learned a lot from the past experience when choosing your ring in choosing which ring you you want to to use how do you weigh in annular dynamics into the, the decision making process this is a difficult question because on, on the one hand, you want to uh, restore the physiology in terms of the saddle shape of the mitral valve. On the other hand, you also want to have a dynamic annulus. Now, uh, this is kind of difficult to achieve with, a, with one ring design. Um, for younger patients, um, we, you, you want to use a dynamic ring who allows opening and diastolic opening and systolic uh, narrowing of the mitral valve ring. So I think uh, the whole ring philosophy should orient itself on the patient demand. So for each patient, uh, you may take a different ring. Dr. Wan, how do you approach what ring to choose? This is actually patient? a very uh, uh, interesting subject that we studied over the last uh, seven, eight years. And now in our institution first, 100% patient receive ring. We don't leave the patient after repair without ring. And in the past, we uh, we chose different uh, different uh, type of ring. But now, mainly depends on patient's annular height commercial width ratio, which determined by the pre-op 3D echo. When the ratio is above or equal to 15%, we use a semi-rigid ring, which is uh, more, as uh, Dr. Long said, more uh, uh, flexible, which uh, fit patient's native saddle shape. And uh, when the annular height commercial waist ratio below 15%, we choose so-called a saddle ring. What are some of the barriers 
for adoption of neocords? What are some of the, the technical barriers out there that you see in adopting neocord technology? I'm not sure whether there are technical barriers. Uh, what is important in surgery is that you do what you know how to, to do it. Sure. So if you're good with resection um, and all the different uh, transposition techniques of, of cords and all this, um, you should do it. And if if you're good with neocords, you should do a neocord technique. The neocord technique is fairly simple, and this is also why it became so popular in, in recent years, because all the, the surgeons who do minimal invasive techniques, they tend to use neocords because it's just easier and faster. But there is no right or wrong. Dr. Wan, what are your thoughts about neocord? Yeah. That's obstacles, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really uh, also an interesting uh, subject. We uh, learned a lot from uh, Dr. Patrick Perrier. Initially, we also adapt his uh, uh, sort of a principle, try to preserve more leaflet. But uh, over the recent years, we noticed actually some leaflet you have to resect a little bit. So uh, now I think uh, around 50% or a little bit less, we still do resection. Not really uh, uh, 100% uh, respect rather than resect. But uh, for the Asian patient, actually, as I mentioned, there are not many uh, tissue for you to manipulate. So we tend to preserve more tissue rather than resect. We almost uh, never do a quadrangular resection now. We, we do triangular resection and uh, try to preserve more tissues. For posterior leaflet disease, describe to me your ideal patient where you would use neocords and an ideal patient that you would actually resect. I think more than 90% patient will use uh, artificial cording. Uh, it's almost a routine now. Right. Even we resect, we still use a cording to, uh, to use cords. repair. Yeah. But Lang, what's the ideal patient that you use cords and versus an ideal patient that you would actually resect for the posterior leaflet? For posterior leaflet, we almost exclusively use neocords. Mm -hmm. However, you, you can also opt for resection if the height of the segment that is prolapsing Usually the P2 pro, uh, uh, segment is very long. It's, it's more than two and a half centimeters. You might as well do a resection and you may be very well off. I want to probe both of you about some of the new technologies out on the horizon right now. How do we get surgeon involvement with mitral clip technology? Right now, cardiologists can do mitral clip really without our involvement. How do we get surgeon involvement with mitral clip as well as, well as with some of the transcatheter, transeptal mitral valve replacement technology out there? We'll start with Dr. Lane. There are different ways to do this. We started uh, as a surgical team in 2007 with the uh, transcatheter aortic valve implantations. At that time, there had been just 200 cases done all over the world. So uh, we started to learn wire techniques. We started to learn imaging. And now we have done almost 2,000 cases, and uh, the surgical team is uh, competent to do this. Now, once you are competent to do this, then you can also do mitral clip. But you shouldn't start with a mitral clip, probably. You should start with transfermal, transcatheter aortic valves, and then develop your program. Another uh, important issue for many surgeons is that they may not have uh, imaging, uh, good imaging in a hybrid room. If you do not have a hybrid room, then uh, you have a really hard time to do transcatheter aortic valve implantations. But Juan, what about in Asia? How do you get uh, uh, surgeon adoption yes. with the transcatheter technique. So, so my personal view for the mitral clip is uh, this is still an indication which when surgeon said uh, cannot do surgery or they don't want to do surgery, that's the indication for mitral clip. If surgeons say this is a surgical indicated and suitable case, should be considered for surgical repair rather than mitral clip. And fortunately, our ho hospital, the cardiologists agree with this principle. So when surgeon offers surgery and the patient accepts that, they won't insist for mitral clip. And that's why we have a very good relationship. We collaborate with each other and we uh, discuss every case in the heart team meeting. Sure. Yeah. I wanted to end with the concept of learning mitral valve repair techniques. And we know that actually very few surgeons out there are repairing valves where they probably should be repairing the valves. What are some of the obstacles to actually learning mitral valve repair techniques? I'll start with Dr. Wan. I think first, 
you need to learn from the very experienced surgeon. So as uh, Dr. Long mentioned, uh, you try to attend the workshop or uh, visit the other center of excellence, try to pick up the right technique and set up the right team, work with you, with the cardiologist, with anesthetist, and with your assistant. And a lot of time after your learning curve passed, usually between 20 to 50 cases, then you will gain a lot of confidence then actually the program will grow automatically. And I think uh, cardiologists start to feel confident to the surgical colleagues. They will refer more patients, and then the, the program will automatically uh, build up. Dr. Lang. I, there's hardly anything to add to, uh, to what you said. You're absolutely right. Um, you start with conferences. You start with, uh, uh, with having... Uh, experienced surgeons on your side, starting with reading and thinking about what you're doing, and you s you start with gaining experience. And you need a lot of experience, and I almost think that in the future we will have more subspecialization in, in cardiac surgery, because to be a competent mitral valve surgeon, one says that you should do at least 50 cases a year. Now, in most centers, uh, they don't even do 50 cases for all surgeons, so it's uh, uh, hardly imaginable that one surgeon does 50 cases. So probably, as we have special teams for transplantation, for pedi pediatric cardiac surgery, we will have in the future teams who work on the aortic root, who work on the mitral valve, who are specialized in those techniques. And perhaps one way to actually learn is to attend the EACTS here in Barcelona, Spain. So as we wrap up, we're here in Barcelona, Spain at the AACTS. We have two very distinguished master surgeons giving their perspective from Germany and from Europe, as well as from Asia, Dr. Juan. Hopefully throughout this roundtable discussion, we've learned a little bit more about advanced mitral valve repair techniques, some of the technologies out there, and hopefully it was educational for you. Thank you, Dr. Linger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.